We're in 1 Timothy tonight, 1 Timothy chapter number 4, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Uh, we looked at uh, a little more than half the chapter last week. What we're looking at in this chapter, uh, we're, we're considering the thought a good minister. I get my, my subject from verse 6 where Paul tells young Timothy, he's a young pastor, and Paul tells Timothy, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And certainly the things in chapter 4, if Timothy uh, informs the church there at Ephesus of the things mentioned in chapter 4, he's going to be a good minister. I really believe Paul is saying, the totality of this epistle, what, what, what you're learning in this epistle, you let these people know this and keep this before them, you will be a good minister. I don't think that Paul is saying this is the only thing that will make you a good minister. There are other things involved, but uh, you can't be a good minister without preaching the whole counsel of God. You have to, you have to preach the word of God. You can't leave some of it out. You can't, you can't just preach preferences and hobby horses. I really, I really thought years ago. This is before I, you know, obviously before I moved here. Like one of these days, if I if I pastor a church that has a camp meeting, uh, I thought about putting. You know, might have to get one from maybe Brother Toby or somebody. Uh, maybe get uh, get one of those. I can't even th think what you call it. Where you tie the horse up. What do you call that? Whatever it is called, that you tie that that piece of wood that you tie the horse up. I thought about putting it outside the church, put a sign on it, and say, tie all your hobby horses up here. And, and do the hitching post. That's it. That's what And uh, tie all your hobby horses up. So that during camp meeting, when the preachers come by, they just tie up all their hobby horses out there and don't bring them in here and just preach the Bible. And we really need a revival of that in these days. We, we, have, we, we have enough opinions from the pulpit. I'm kind of giving you my opinion right now, so forgive me for that. But we do have enough opinion. We need to preach the word of God. And I think that's what Paul is emphasizing here. So last week, we looked at the first uh, seven, eight, nine verses, actually maybe 11 verses. And we looked at a good minister will remind the people of perverted doctrine. We saw in the first five verses, uh, uh, Paul's emphasis of false teaching. Then verses 6 to 11, faithful teaching. But tonight we're going to look at a good minister will also regard the priority of personal duties. A good minister will regard the priority, and it is a priority, of personal duties. In other words, verse 12, that's where we're going to, we're going to begin tonight. Verse 12 down to verse 16, Paul is talking directly to the pastor. He's talking to Timothy. Now, when we come to passages like this in the Word of God, uh, it can take on a, a strange tone in the sermon because basically there's only one guy in here that it applies to, and that's, that's the man standing right here. And so as the pastor, what I'm going to be preaching to you tonight is what Paul is saying to Joy Wampler as the pastor of Fundamental Baptist Church or any other pastor for that matter. However... In verse 12, the, the first verse of this passage, Paul says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. I'm going to say something about that in just a moment. But I want to begin right here by, by saying that in this passage where Paul is talking to the pastor and how he is to conduct himself and what he is to do for himself spiritually uh, and controlling himself and guiding himself, what the pastor is to do is also to be an example of the believers. I'm saying that to say this. As I'm preaching tonight a message or a text that is directed to the pastor, there's going to be a parallel application, a twofold application. Yes, clearly it's going to apply to the pastor of the church. But because the pastor of the church has been put in a position of example, this will have a direct application to you as well. So as we walk down through the passage, I'll, I'll talk about here's what I as the pastor am supposed to do. But at the same time, make personal application in your own life. Because what the pastor is to do in his doing that, it's to be an example to the members of the church. 
And so as we're examining the duties of the pastor, uh, you, you're going to also see the duties of the church member as well. So let's jump into our text tonight. This is part two of a good minister. As I said, last week we looked at a good minister will remind the people of perverted doctrine, but a good minister will also regard the priority, and it is absolutely a priority. He will regard the priority of personal duties. So let's get into our text tonight. Verse 12, he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that, it is, that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So these are the personal obligations of a pastor. When I say personal obligations, I'm talking about uh, a pastor's relationship with himself. How a pastor uh, continuously examines his own personal life so that he can be the pastor that God wants him to be. And in verse 12, God wants the pastor to be, and here's the word I'm using, symbolic. He's to be an example, a symbol, if you will, of the Christian life. He says in verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. Now, real quickly, Timothy, as I stated, is a younger pastor at the time. You say, well, how would we apply this uh, for our situation? Well, I'm a young pastor, and don't you judge me for that. And so I'm just a young guy. I'm very inexperienced. I'm just starting out this thing very young. So that's how I'm going to apply this passage tonight. This is blonde. It's not gray. So I am a young pastor. But he says, he says, do not let them despise thy youth. In other words, don't live in such a way where they can criticize you for being young. And I, I struggle with that um, in my, with the first church I pastored. Now, I started pastoring at the age of 29, which is not the youngest. Uh, my Uncle Jimmy, for example, he started pastoring, I think he was about 20 or 21. Uh, uh, Brother Ricky Gravely. Uh, from over there in uh, North Georgia, I think he started pastoring when he was 18. If I'm not mistaken, I think in one weekend, I think if I understood Brother Ricky uh, correctly, he graduated high school, got married, and started pastoring a church in one weekend because he's such a brilliant man. Anyway, I'll just play. No, Brother, uh, brother Ricky's tremendous. And, and, and you, have to ha you have to be somebody like Brother Ricky to do something like that. I'm not like that. Therefore, God waited until I was 29 before I started pastoring a church. And so, but when I started passing that church, the youngest people in the church were 54 years old. That was the youth program. A 54-year-old couple. That's the youngest people in the church. And, and that was the chairman of the deacons at the time. And uh, even his wife asked him, they told me about the conversation. His wife asked him, said, are you going to be able to pastor, or be pastored by someone that's so much younger than you? In fact, uh, his son, the chairman of deacon's son, he and I grew up together. That we were, I'm about maybe three years older than his, his son. And so uh, that was a little struggle there at, at the beginning. The, these much older folk uh, having to submit to a very inexperienced young pastor. And the previous pastor uh, before me, I believe he was in his early 80s uh, when he resigned the church. And so you can imagine going from an 80-year-old man pastoring to a 29-year-old man pastoring. And that might be a situation similar to what Timothy's dealing with. He's a young man. He's going to have older saints. So he needs to conduct himself in such a way where they cannot say, you're, you're, you're living the way you're, you're living. You're deciding the way you're deciding because you're so youthful and because you're young. He says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou. Here's, here's the contradiction to that. Be thou an example of the believers, how? In word, that's what you say, your speech. In conversation, that word conversation is not used today as it was used when the King James Bible was translated. Conversation here is talking about your conduct, your lifestyle. When it says in word, that's talking about your conversation as we use the word conversation today, how you speak to people. In conversation, it's talking about your lifestyle, how you live. 
in charity? Do you live in a, a loving way? In spirit, that's talking about your fervency. In faith, that's walking in faith, walking with God, trusting the Lord. And in purity, living a clean life. A pastor is to be an example in word. How I speak, how I speak to people is very important. If I have a temper problem, if I, if I fly off the handle, if I say ungracious things, if, 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 I, if I misspeak to people and, and speak harshly to people, I'm not going to be a good example as a pastor. In fact, in fact, take your Bible real quick. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. And this is a verse that, that really does apply to all of us. Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 29 of Ephesians chapter number 4. He says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Think about this. When you are in a conversation with someone and you depart, are they better off for that conversation they have with you or are they worse off? And that's decided by how we apply this verse. On a personal level, pastoral level, when you're in my presence and we're speaking, Lord willing, when you walk away from Joey Wampler, Lord willing, you should be better off than when you approached me to begin with. Uh, I, if I speak correctly, if I speak Christian, if I speak biblically, that's exactly what it will be. And so I'm to be an example in word, in conversation. In my, that means lifestyle, how I live. I need to live the Christian life. I need to practice what I preach. It is, not, it is not healthy at all. In fact, it's very ungodly for a preacher to stand in the pulpit and say, y'all ought to do this, then I go do, some, do something, something different. And I disobey the word of God. So we ought to live in such a way that is scriptural, lines up with the Bible, our lifestyle. In charity, we ought to be loving, gracious, love people. Uh, we, we, we need to be giving people, loving people. And love people as God loves people. In spirit, that, that has to do with your, your inner man, your fervency, your passion for the things of God. I am to have a level of fervency, a level of zeal for the cause of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the ministry. Uh, to a degree, it ought to consume me, if I can say it that way. I, I, I need to have a passion about the things of God. And in that, having that passion, it is to be an example for the believer or the church members. In faith, I'm to trust God. The preacher is supposed to trust God. I'm, I'm, to, I'm to walk by faith, trust his word, believe what it says, and make application in my life. And I'm, I'm to live that in front of you. I'm to live in purity. I'm to have cleanliness in my speech, but cleanliness in my lifestyle. I'm, to, I'm supposed to live pure. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, this pastor who I just, and to this day, it just, boggles my mind how how he fell and he was one of my favorite preachers uh, I had him preach at the first church I pastored I had him come and preach for me I just uh, just a tremendous preacher and what I didn't know was was what some of the men in the church began to know it was what when our church it was another church uh, but I knew everybody in that church I knew all of the people there uh, and so two of the men that were deacons of that church, uh, were close friends of mine. And they came to me and told me that they're, they're going to revival meeting with their pastor, with their pastor. And they're riding up the highway, and the preacher would look over into a car or something that had a lady in it and make lewd remarks, vulgar remarks. And they're sitting there just flabbergasted and shocked at, at the impurity uh, of this individual. And eventually, uh, he had a tremendous ugly fall as well. But my lifestyle, privately and around you, ought to be a pure lifestyle. Uh, you should be able to come into my presence and not leave offended at something filthy or ungodly. Uh, that's how I'm supposed to live. But I'm also to be the example so that means you and I together are to 
walk in the word of God in word, in conversation, lifestyle, in charity or love, in spirit, fervency, in faith, and purity. So while I make an application in my own life, you need to make application as well in your life concerning these very things. So how is your speech with others? How's your lifestyle? How's your love for others? How is your, by the way, I, I want to thank God for Fundamental Baptist Church. Even this past Saturday, excuse me, Sunday night with our fall festival, uh, there were people that visited uh, here that were not known by us that came and visited, and they were not even remotely, li I'm talking, they, they didn't line up religiously, biblically, or anything else like us, yet our church was gracious to them. And uh, that's, that's what charity is. That's what charity is. In spirit, we all ought to be fervent for the things of God. In faith, we all, all ought to trust God and his word and walk by faith. And we all ought to clean up our lives and live pure. In our speech and in our lifestyle, we need to live pure. So the pastor is to be uh, symbolic. He is to be studious in verse 13. Paul said, till I come. And remember in chapter 3, Paul said, I'm anticipating coming to see you. I may tarry. Things may happen where, where I can't get to you when I want to. But till I come, give attendance to reading. To reading. I'm going to tell the young preachers in this church, if you don't like to read, you picked the wrong field to go into. Some of y'all have uh, walked by my office, especially the young people. Some of the older people, y'all may have no idea. Like, what is that funny-looking chair the preacher has in his office? It's kind of loud. It's blue and black. It's kind of funny-looking. All them kids know what it is. They walk in there, preacher, that's a gamer's chair. The, my, my office chair is, is a chair that, you know, the gamers, you know, the, the nerds that sit there and do this, you know, 24 hours a day. Uh, it's one of those kind of chairs. And the reason why I got one of those chairs is, is because those gamers, they have to sit. Well, they don't have to. They choose to sit for hours and hours a day. So they're going to have a comfortable chair. But they're not the only ones that have to sit for a long time. A pastor has to sit for a long time. Because you have to sit, and you have to study, and you have to read, you have to focus. Now, I do have to get up every now and then. I do have to stretch. I'm so young. I, st I got to stretch more in these days. And so I get up, walk around, have to stretch, whatever. But I have to sit there with my Bible, with my computer, with my commentaries, with my books. I got to study. I got to study. And so I have to give attendance to reading. So if, you, if you're called to preach and don't like reading, ask God to help you get a love for reading. But can I make application to all of us? Uh, reading is connected to intelligence. So the more, yeah, believe it or not. And so the more you read, the better off you'll be. And I'm not talking about reading nonsense. I'm talking about reading things that will edify you, that will strengthen you. Find good books to read. And read, and by all means, read your Bible. Give it to us to reading, to exhortation, to uplifting people, to encouraging people, and then to doctrine. These are things that I'm to give attendance to. I need to be someone who reads, who studies. I need to be someone who exhorts, who uplifts people. And I need to be someone who is, you know, fleshing out the doctrines. What does the Bible say about this? doesn't matter what we think about it. The only thing that matters is what the Word of God says. The words on the page are the only thing that matters, and that's what doctrine is. But if that is important for the pastor, it's also going to be important for you. Be an exhorter. When you come to church, anticipate and plan on being someone who lifts others up. You've got a choice when you walk in the door. You can either come in and bring somebody down, or you can come in and bring somebody up. And that's all of our choice. We all have a choice. Let's be exhorters. In fact, somebody brought this up the other day. I think it might have been Brother, Brother Adams. You might have brought this up, up in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains. They, they, them old timers, they used to have what was called exhorters. And, uh, and we had one at Resurrection Baptist Church. And he's, he's still there. His name is Roy Hell. And uh, Brother Roy will jump up 
in the middle of a service and he will begin to exhort. He's not a preacher, he's not called to preach, but he'll, he'll get to preaching and he will exhort the people and strengthen the people and uplift the people. And, and usually the service turns toward a, toward a more worshipful manner, if I can say it that way, when he gets finished exhorting because he's encouraged everybody. He's, he's pointed people to Jesus. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be a Roy Hale, but everybody needs to be a, someone who wants to uplift others and not bring them down. And doctrine. Do you know why you believe what you believe? Do you know why you believe? Now, I can do my best to teach the doctrines of the Word of God, but you only hear me three times a week. But you've got this all day, every day at your house. Learn what the Bible says. So a pastor is to be studious. A pastor, number three, is to be, and here's the word I want to use, self-improving. Now, I'm using a, a term that's used often in the secular realm, uh, but I'm not applying it in such a way. But I needed a word to start with an S, and so that's why I went with this one. Self-improving. I'm not talking about the self-help movement that's taking place out there. But every Christian, but here in this passage, the pastor is to, is to focus on his own spirituality. Look at verse number 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now, that's a negative way of saying a positive thing. He's saying neglect not the gift that is in thee, but what he's implying is you are to cultivate the gift that is in thee. He says you to no, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He's talking about the ordination council. He's talking about when you as a pastor, a preacher, you are before the ordination council, the presbytery, and they, they speak to you, they encourage you, they instruct you. I remember it was a very nervous time when I was ordained. I'm sitting in this chair. I'm sitting beside my pastor. He's asking me this list of questions. I've got these, these men of God in here. They're hearing me answer these questions. My pastor's asking me to, in detail, explain these doctrines without notes. And I've got to tell these people not only what I believe, but why I believe it. And so it was, a, it was a nervous time. Thankfully, Brother Larry Melton, who was the associate pastor, knowing to my pastor, slipped me the questions uh, maybe an hour before it started. And so I was able to cheat a little bit. And, uh, but Preacher Mac is in heaven, so it's no problem now. <laughs> Not going to get any trouble. But Brother Larry, the associate pastor, he may have slipped me the notes. Here you go, read this before we get in there. But I had to still explain these doctrines. Then when they were done... They put their, they laid their hands on my head, my back. They prayed over me after they encouraged me and spoke to me. That's, what's talk, that's what he's talking about right here. He's talking about the way you got started. The influence of those men that they had on your life when you got started in this thing. Don't neglect what was given to you at the beginning and cultivate that. Work on that. Watch yourself. Grow. That's what I'm supposed to do. Now, you, as the church, as the body, more than likely, unless you're an associate pastor like Brother Clint, or you become a pastor, or you're a deacon, you won't go through an ordination process. Or maybe you'll, you'll be a missionary. You'll, you'll go through an ordination process. But unless, unless you're one of those uh, positions, one of those offices, you won't go through an ordination process. But... You do have a beginning. In fact, most Christians have two beginnings. They have the one where they get saved, and then they have that one later on some point in time where they surrender. They give their all. And so what you're to do as a child of God is cultivate your spiritual life. In fact, let me give you a couple of verses. Go to 1 Peter real quickly. Go to 1 Peter. Chapter number 2, please. 1 Peter 2. Verse number one, wherefore laying aside all malice, that means laying aside means get rid of it. Don't Put it down and don't pick it up again. Lay it aside. 
all malice, all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Man, if every local church would do that, our churches would have revival. Just, just verse 1. If we would do verse 1, we'd have revival. Verse 2. As newborn babes, he's not saying stay a babe. That's not what he's implying. He's saying like a baby. Like a baby. You may have been saved 30 years, but like a baby, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may what? Grow. If something grows, it is being cultivated. You know what that word means. We have plenty of people in here who have green thumbs. We've got, we've got farmers. We've got gardeners in this building, in this congregation. You know what this is. And just as you must take care and apply the right things and do the right things for that plant to grow, whatever it is, you, you've got to do certain things for that to grow. As a Christian, you and I, we've got to do certain things to grow. And one of the things we must desire the sincere milk of the word. Go to 2 Peter and look at the very last verse of the entire book. Chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Somebody tell me, how can I gain more knowledge of Jesus Christ? There's only one way. Say it real loud. The Bible. To desire the word of God that you can grow and you can know the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll grow to be more like him and you'll know more about him through the word of God. So go back to 1 Timothy. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Don't neglect that gift. The way you got started, cultivate that grow in that. The pastor is to be submitted. Look at verse number 15 of chapter number 4. 1 Timothy 4 verse 15. I'm to be submitted. He says, meditate upon these things. I am to contemplate on these things. But then he says, give thyself wholly to them. Don't, don't hold anything back. In my life, I, I'm not allowed to say, Lord, you can have this, but I get to keep this. No, it's complete surrender. Complete. Holy to them. Give thyself wholly to them. That thy profiting may appear to all. Now, this is the part that frightens me. Verse 12 is scary, and this part's frightening. He says, you will watch my growth. Now, I got here. At the age of 48, the fundamental Baptist Church, got here at 48 years old, been here two and a half years. And once we get to year 10, year 15, year 20, and I'm planning on this, year 20, I'm planning on it. Actually, I'm planning on it, the rapture. Uh, I'm not planning on resignation, I'm planning on rapture, just to let you know. But as, as I continue as the pastor here, you are to be able to watch my growth. If, if the Lord doesn't come back and the day does come where I've, I've, I've gained some age because I'm really young right now, so i got a long time. But there'll come a day, time where I will, if the Lord doesn't come back, I will have to step down. I won't be able to do it anymore. But when that time comes, I should be more like Christ and closer to Jesus then than I was when I first got here. You're to, you're to see that in my life. And watch that. And if that, that'll take place if I continuously give myself wholly to them, to these truths. So my friend, as the example, as a pastor's example, I'm making parallel application to the pastor, but also to the people. You're to give yourself wholly to the things of God. There's a reason why we all sing the song, I surrender all. We ought to surrender all. Give it all to Jesus. Young people, Give it all to him. Don't hold nothing back. The Christian life is not necessarily an easy life by any means. But it is absolutely the best life. I mean, you think about this. As imperfect as we are, 
There's a God in heaven who wants to use us. Who desires to use our life to work in our lives, to work through our lives. But that only happens when we give ourselves to him. And lastly, the pastor is supposed to be symbolic, studious, self-improving, submitted, and then safeguarding. The pastor is to be safeguarding for himself and others. Look at verse 16. Take heed unto thyself, meaning I'm to guard my spirituality. A pastor is to guard his spirituality. He's to walk cautiously. The Bible speaks of walking circumspectly. I'm to walk carefully. Take heed to thyself. There has to be barriers that a pastor puts up in his life. Has to. If the pastor gets loosey-goosey with the, the guarding of his life, some terrible things can either happen or terrible things can be accused of happening. Got to guard. I don't feel tempted at all to steal money from this church, but I don't want to be able to sign checks. I don't want to know what you tithe. If tithing records are ever checked, and they're liable to be, well, they'll likely be the deacons that do so. I don't want to know the amount. I don't, I don't want my hands in the money. I do have a church card. But Machina sees every transaction that takes place and we bring her a receipt. Every penny by the grace of God is accounted for. You say, well, why would you do I, I don't feel tempted at all. But why would I put myself in a position why, why would I put myself in a position where I'm the only one counting the money or I'm the only one signing checks or I'm the one carrying the money to the bank? Even if I didn't do anything, if somebody accused me of that, well, I have no defense. Or not enough of a defense. Got to be barriers. Got an office back there with all my books and my gamer's chair that I really like sitting in. It is very comfortable. Go back and sit it sometime. It's really nice. I enjoy going in there and study. It's, 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 a, it's a haven of rest, that office. But if there's a woman that's not my wife, comes in that office and we shut that door, it's not a haven of rest anymore. Ladies, if that offends you, I, I need to talk to you privately, preacher. If you can't talk to me in that room with my wife sitting there, you got a bigger problem than what you think your problem is. And this is way too important to me. I don't feel tempted. I don't need the accusation. No, 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 accusations happen. People tell lies. That happens. But I don't need to give anybody ammunition for an ac accusation. But the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. It doesn't say abstain from evil. That's a given. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Don't even look like you're in a position to do something like that. That's what he's saying here. Take heed to thyself. Because if I don't put those safeguards up, even if I do nothing wrong, the fact the appearance of the wrong is there, and now we're in trouble. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Take heed to the doctrine i got to stay on top of what I believe. It's not that this changes, this stays the same. But this can change and this can change. And oftentimes, many pastors, the older they get, they either get really harsh or really loose. And it's God's will for me to keep a balance the best I can. Probably one of the two is going to happen. It's probably going to be the harsh one. I'm, I'm, I know where I come from. I know my ancestors. If you knew some of my, well, my grandma, she'd be 
be a little rough. Loving woman made a, just fed me wonderfully when I lived with her. Just amazing cook, wonderful lady. Wonderful, she was a wonderful wife to my grandma. But she, she could come down hard on you. So y'all got a lot to look forward to in the next 20 years, the older I get. You better hope I turn out like my grandpa. That's what you better hope. Be a lot nicer around here. But most pastors go either harsh or they're, they're loose. But the goal is to stay even, stay balanced, stay, stay centered in the word of God. And that's what he's talking about. Take heed to the doctrine. Keep that before you. Continue in them. There it is. Steadfast. Stay that way. Don't, don't compromise. Continue in them. For in doing this, if I, if I watch myself, if I watch what the Bible teaches and stick with it, and I continue with them and keep a balanced life, he says, in them, if I do these things, doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. He's not talking about saving my soul. I'm already saved. He's not talking about saving your soul unless you are lost. He's talking about Christians in the church, a pastor and believers in the church. He's talking about delivering us from apostasy, delivering us from a life of sin. For we fall into sin, we mess up. And he says, Timothy, if you'll take heed to yourself and the doctrine, the word of God, stay faithful in that, stay balanced in that, you won't fall, and more than likely, they won't fall. But if I wobble on the axle, if I get loose theologically or if I get loose morally and there's, there's some wobbling, it's not going to end well for you or me. Therefore, there has to be that consistency, that steadfastness, that balance. Now, let me apply this to you. The pastor may possibly live a, an exemplary life. And I'm, I'm convinced uh, the, the 19 years prior to me getting, getting here, you watched a man's life. I'm going back to him because you, you know him better than you know me, and that's Brother Rustin. You watched him. Some of you grew up under his ministry. You watched his consistency, his humility, his faithfulness uh, here at this church for, for 19 years. You saw that. But you, now what, by him being what he was, that gave you a safer place to be a Christian. It puts you in a safer position, a safer uh, place. But you still have to choose for yourself to do right. Now, if, if I choose to go wrong, I'm not just going to take myself out. Somebody else is going to go with me, more than likely. That's what he's talking about here, saving yourself and them that hear you. But if I stay right, I'm giving you a better chance of staying right as well. But you still have to make your decision. There's been a lot of great churches with great pastors and people in those churches sitting under great preaching, seeing an example in the pulpit, and they made bad decisions, went the wrong way, and they destroyed their life either because of bad doctrine or because of bad behavior. You still have to make your decision. So, let me say it this way. I'm going to stand before the Lord with how I pastor this church, how I live as a Christian as the pastor of this church. I'm going to stand before the Lord with that. You're not going to give an account for how I am. But when it's time for you to stand before the Lord, you're not going to be able to say, if I fall, if I fall and you fall, you're not going to be able to say it's all the preacher's fault. Take heed to yourself. Know what you believe and stay faithful. Don't compromise in your... Well, I'm trying not to compromise in mine. You don't compromise in yours. And let's stay true to Jesus and his word. And whether it's rapture or resignation, we want this thing one of these days. 